Professor Milner's study at the cutting edge of genetic research is called RNA interference. It treats the cancer at its genetic root. Conventional treatments of, of cancer, uh, including chemotherapy and radiotherapy, are, are effective uh, for, for various tumor types, but have the disadvantage in that they also damage normal cells. In other words, they're, they're non-selective for the cancer. The, the huge advantage of RNA interference is that, that it, it can be tailored to selectively target cancer cells. Genes are read by messenger RNA, which takes their instructions to the protein-making factories in the cell. Professor Milner's technique prevents the message from the cancer genes reaching these factories. It stops the message by effectively shooting the messenger. The agent that does this, a molecule called short interfering RNA, is introduced into the cell that's been infected by the cancer virus. Here it combines with the messenger RNA carrying the virus's cancer-making instructions to the protein factory and destroys it, causing the cancer cells to self-destruct. On paper, it's an amazing concept. The question was, could Professor Milner get it to work in practice on these killers, the cervical cancer cells? You can see that the picture immediately is, is different. There are far fewer cells. Uh, and here are the cells with the halos around them. These are cells which are in the process of committing uh, suicide, essentially. These are dead. These are the remnants of cells, of the cancer cells. It was, it was a wonderful feeling looking down the microscope and seeing these results. You could see that those cells were dying, whereas normal cells, which had had exactly the same treatment, were completely unaffected. Now we've got a technology which allows us to interfere directly with the actual RNA genes of the virus. And certainly in these its early days, the progress has been quite remarkable. So what we might have is a new generation of medicines. From Professor Milner's research, you might think a cure for cervical cancer was imminent, but human trials are at least three years away. Our poll has found overwhelming optimism that genetic science will bring cures for most diseases. The British and Americans are more skeptical, but even here, more than three out of five people believe genetics will cure disease. I think genetic manipulation, not, not at conception, but past that is going to be the biggest course in medicine probably in the next 20 years. Hopefully the developments in, in genetics will continue to improve our lives. Gene therapy and research like Professor Milner's offers hope to an end to many genetic disorders where only one or two genes are involved. But in other big genetic killers like heart disease, a complex combination of genes is at work and a different approach is needed. Radical techniques using the very latest genetic research hold great promise, but they bring a whole new set of ethical questions. A year and a half ago, Nelson Aguirre was knocking on death's door. He had chronic heart disease after several heart attacks. Without a transplant, his prospects looked grim. I've had two heart operations, including seven bypass procedures. I couldn't climb the stairs, and I had a lot of chest pains. I had no will to live. I was a man that wouldn't survive a third heart attack. But instead of a heart transplant, Nelson underwent a procedure that has brought about an amazing recovery. His severely damaged heart was effectively regenerated, thanks to one of the most controversial areas in genetics today, stem cell therapy. Stem cells are the master cells of our bodies, regenerating and repairing different tissue types. In the past, scientists believed the fate of adult stem cells couldn't be changed. They could only become what they were destined to become. But now, scientists are exploring the idea of taking stem cells from one part of the body and tricking them into becoming cells from another. One organ with almost no stem cells of its own is the heart. Here, dead or damaged heart tissue cannot regenerate. 
but could stem cells from another part of the body be fooled into becoming new heart cells? The notion that you can retrain your own cells to uh, replace, for example, damaged tissue is a tremendously exciting one. It really is. I would say it's the most exciting area in modern genetics or cell biology, which is what it really is. What switches genes on or off to instruct a bone marrow stem cell to become, say, a white blood cell is still very uncertain. But remarkable work being carried out here at the Texas Heart Institute could hold some of the answers. Dr. James Willison, who initiated the research, believes adult stem cells could be far more powerful than had previously been thought. We've become convinced that one can use bone marrow cells as a form of stem cell transplantation in a way that will improve blood flow to the heart and improve the function of the failing heart. Stem cells in Nelson's bone marrow are sucked out using a syringe and filtered to separate off other cells. They are then injected into the ailing heart between the living and dead tissue. The big question was whether this new environment could persuade the stem cells to change into new heart cells rather than the white blood cells they were originally destined to become. Dr. Emerson Perrin, a heart specialist at the Texas Heart Institute, began to build upon the pioneering work. He decided to conduct the trials in his native Brazil. Dr. Perrin has to map the diseased heart in three dimensions by putting a catheter into the organ via an artery in the leg. As this map builds up, it represents Nelson's heart before the stem cell injections. In a healthy person, this would all be purple. The red areas show where his heart has been savaged by heart attacks. Here you can see a purple spot. This area contracts normally. So you can tell immediately that this heart is very, very sick. If we lift this heart up and look at the bottom surface, these black dots are the actual sites in which we have injected the stem cells in the area most needing better blood supply, better blood flow, and, and where there was potential for recovery. The next part of the 45-minute procedure involved precisely injecting the stem cells into the heart using a tiny syringe fed up into the beating organ via the artery in the leg.